Our Father in heaven, right now I thank you. I thank you for this day. I thank you for your mercy, your love, and your guidance over all of our lives. I thank you for the cross. I thank you for your sacrifice. I ask that this service is blessed, Lord, that you are here. Lord, bless our participation in communion and the bread and the wine. Right now, I ask, also ask that you bless this message, Lord, so that everything that is said is not of my own thoughts, but things that I was received from the Bible and from the Holy Spirit. I ask that everything we do be for your glory. Amen. So, is this anybody's first ever time seeing communion? I'm not saying participating, but seeing communion. Just seeing these symbols on the table. It's one person. Thank you. I'm glad you're here. Praise God. So, we, most of us, have seen this. A lot of us have participated in this. We know that communion is something that us followers of Jesus Christ participate in and culturally once a month, the first Sunday of each month. But what is communion? See, in the beginning, I want to bring up Google, and Google gives this definition. The ser- communion is the service of Christian worship at which bread and wine are consecrated, otherwise known as made sacred, and shared. And Google also used it as a sentence. How nice of them. Communion was celebrated once a month. Very simple, very easy sentence, no detail, no, not even any reverence, just they used the word in a sentence. See, but why do we celebrate this day? Why do we have this, have this special service once a month? The definition of communion that Google gives us does not convey the deeper message behind this sacrament. And we see that. First of all, we read almost every single time, it's read up here, 1 Corinthians 11, verses, and I'm going to read 1 Corinthians 11, verses 23 through 26. 1 Corinthians 11, 23 through 26. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on that night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this and remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until, this, until he comes. This was the way that Jesus Christ spent the Passover with his disciples. This moment in history has been famously known as the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper also by many people throughout history. There's even a very famous painting that commemorates this day. But what's so important about it? Why do we do this? And I think the, one of the ways we realize why we do this, we really understand why we have to participate in communion is when we dive deep into the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for us. When we really look at what happened on Calvary, when we really look what happened on the Golgotha. See, we think it's easy. We think it's just, oh, we're just remembering Christ. But is that where our thought process ends? Do we just look at it and say, well, yeah, Jesus died for us. And then we eat the bread, we drink the wine, we pray and we sit down. And the next day we go on with our daily lives. I don't think so. I really don't. I don't think that's how we should look at it. And I know that sometimes we as Christians, we are very busy. We have our day-to-day lives. And then communion sneaks up on us. I know it snuck up on me. The thing is, it's you're at work, you're at school, you're doing all this work. And then Friday comes and you realize, oh, wait, church is on Sunday. And then you realize, oh, it's March 3rd, which means it's the first of the month. So there isn't that buildup for it. There isn't that realization until the last second and then you say oh snap that happened that's going on or you come into church on Sunday and you see this table and you're like oh that's today so the somewhat unexpected twist I know it's not going to be unexpected for any of you but is that I will be reading out of the Old Testament today to really study the sacrifice of Jesus Christ 
we are going to read Isaiah 53. We read in Isaiah the prophecy that was opened up to him by God, and the detail that was opened up by this prophet is amazing, and nothing short of a miracle, nothing short of supernatural. Isaiah lived 700 years before this event happened. How would he know? He also doesn't just depict the event, but he also speaks of the meanings of what happened. An interesting thing is that critics of the Bible, of which there are so many these days and getting more and more by the day, is they argue that it is impossible that Isaiah lived or later in life, that Isaiah lived during the time of this, because the detail that Isaiah brings up is, as I said earlier, nothing short of miraculous. However, they argued and argued until in 1946, a few shepherds came across seven scrolls. These are called either the, the Dead Sea Scrolls or the Qumran Cave Scrolls. When excavated, people found many, many manuscripts. And one of the best preserved manuscripts was the book of Isaiah. It was perfectly sealed and preserved. And after dating it, they realized that, yes, indeed, the prophecy of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah was written 700 years before the birth and death of Christ. So we will start with verse number one, verse one of Isaiah 53, and I would like to read the whole chapter. Who has believed what he has heard from us, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant, and like a root out of the dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by, many, by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men, men hid, sorry, hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed." All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, and as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief when his soul makes an offering for guilt. He shall see his offspring, he shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore I will divide him a portion with the many, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong. Because he poured out his soul to death and was numbered with the transgressors, yet he bore the sin of many and makes intercession for the transgressors. So it is March, which... As we know, at the end of this month, we will be celebrating probably the most amazing, amazing celebration possible. We will be celebrating Easter, which is the resurrection of Christ. And the end of this chapter does talk a little bit about the positives and a little bit about the hope that we have. But I want to back it up a bit and today focus on the sacrifice. Focus on what happened that night, that day on Calvary. We read in, chapter, in verse number five, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. Isaiah writes that he was pierced for our transgressions. You see, that is hauntingly accurate of a depiction of what happened when we realize now that he literally was pierced on the cross with nails for our sins. 
This man lived 700 years before this happened. And God opened him up these mysteries. We know that our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, was nailed on the cross. He was crushed. He was beaten for our iniquities, for the sins of our, for our sins, for the sins of mine, my life, for the sins of all of our lives. His hands and feet were nailed to the cross. All, we continue with verse number six. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We read in Romans 3.23 to 25, 3.23 to 25, one of the most famous passages of all scripture. Apostle Paul states, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. Now we see the meaning of the wine that we drink. We see why that the wine is on this table. We see that the wine symbolizes that blood that was poured out for our sins. Our Lord Jesus laid down his life for every one of us because we have turned our back to him. It was not some of us. It wasn't just the Jews or the Romans who actually killed him. It was every single person alive. He talks, about, he talks about us like sheep. And we also know that Jesus Christ, when dis- describing himself, John chapter 10, verse 11, John 10, 11, he states, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. See, up until this moment happened in the Gospels, even the apostles didn't fully understand what was going to happen. We have the privilege today to see the timeline. We have it in front of us through, it's opened up to us by the Bible. And to us, it's easy to say, oh yeah, he lays his his life for the sheep because we see that he literally did. Back then, that was hard to understand. It's like a shepherd that we also know the, I'm not, I'm going to paraphrase this time. We know the the proverb of the shepherd who says, when he has a hundred sheep and one has gone astray, he will leave the 99 and go search for the one lost. He was oppressed, and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. When he was led to be killed, he didn't argue. He didn't say, why is this, why are you doing this to me? He didn't hire lawyers. Even when up when Peter decided to take things into his own hands. Jesus Christ rebuked him and then healed one of the men who came to arrest him. That humility, that obedience that Jesus Christ had because of the love that he had for us is something that I personally forget to look at sometimes. And I know I'm not the only one. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away And as for his generation who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, he was stricken for the the transgression of my people. And they made his grave with the wicked and and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. He died as a criminal, and he died as one of the, the worst possible death that they could think of. The cross, dying, being crucified on the cross was the most painful and most difficult death possible at that time. And he died like a criminal. In fact, he died next to the two criminals. But we read that there was, he had done no violence, and there was no deceit in his mouth. He never lied. He, didn't, he never condoned violence. He never condoned people that didn't, don't believe in him should, should be punished or persecuted. In fact, even when he was dying on the cross, he asked his father to forgive them. So this is why we remember his sacrifice. So this is why we look up at the cross, and especially before we participate in communion. Because this was the only way. This was the only way 
I could receive salvation. This was the only way all of us could receive salvation. And we know that even Jesus Christ himself in Gethsemane prayed to his father. In Matthew 26, we read, Matthew 26, verses 38, 39. Matthew 26, 38, 39. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. Remain here and watch with me. And going a little further, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. We see the obedience. We see the sorrow. We see the pain that our Savior had to go through. Because we do remember he was a man. He was 100% man and 100% God. We know that he felt pain. We know that he felt hunger. We know that he felt thirst. We cannot imagine. We can't even imagine what he was going through. Because one of the most painful things probably for him wasn't even the pain. It wasn't the, the crown of thorns. It wasn't the nails going through his arms, his hands and feet. It wasn't the beatings. It was the fact that God the Father in that moment could not look down on him. Because all of our sins were on Jesus Christ in that moment. That is what probably, not probably, that is what hurt the most, I believe. God's wrath had to be satisfied. And for a perfect God, he needed a perfect sacrifice. That is why all the sheep, the cows, the ox that were sacrificed years prior to this were not enough. God's plan of salvation had to happen. Jesus Christ was that perfect lamb of God who because of his obedience and love for us came down to this earth and died on the cross. So no, communion is not just a tradition. It's not just a religious thing that we do every once in a while. It's the way that we remember and we were told to remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And we have to remember his sacrifice because when we realize how extreme of the punishment that was on Jesus Christ was, that really shines a light on how sinful we really are. When we realize that that was the only way me and you can get salvation, we, we stop taking that for granted. It's not enough to have a cross on a necklace right here. It's not enough even to come once in a while and participate. What is somewhat sad and upsetting is that some Christians today forget about this. And as I said earlier, they, they come in, they participate, and they go home. I know for a fact I've been guilty of that. I can go all week I would go all week without studying the Bible, without even praying deeply to God, and then coming on Sunday, praying for 10 seconds and participating in communion. And I know for a fact that that is not a worthy way of remembering the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made for my, for my sins and the sins of all of us. Romans 5, I'm getting to the end right now. Romans 5, in verses 12 and then verses 18, 19. Verses 12 and then verse 18, 19. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sin. And we also read in verse 18. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience that many were made sinners... So by the one man's obedience, that many will be made righteous. That man whose obedience is talked about here is Jesus Christ. Through his obedience, all of us were made righteous if we choose to follow him. That is why we remember. So please, my dear brothers and sisters, dear church, let us not treat this lightly. Let us realize the cost of our salvation. And before we pray, I just want to mention that this will in return... Show us the true despair that life without Christ brings us. There's no hope for sinful people like me and like all of us. So right now we're going to stand up to pray. And for about two minutes, I'm not going to pray yet. I just want everyone to stand and pray in their hearts. Pray to God.
say thank you, be grateful for everything that he had given us. Amen. Our Father in heaven, right now I thank you. Once again, I thank you. And there's nothing I can say that will fully show our appreciation for what you did on that cross. Through his sacrifice, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, sinners like me, sinners like everyone in this world, have the opportunity, the chance, and the gift to be saved. I ask that you speak into our hearts, that you convict us when we do not treat this with the reverence and the dignity that this sacrament deserves. I ask that you bless this church, every single person in here today, that when we participate in communion today, that we realize the cost, that we look at the cross and we don't just look at it as a sign, but we look at the fact that that event truly happened that our Lord Jesus Christ was punished for our sins, that all of our sins were laid onto him. I ask for your guidance. I ask for your help because we are weak and you alone are strong. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you for your body that was broken for us. Thank you for your blood that was spilled out for my sins. I ask that everything we do from this point forward today and tomorrow and every day be for your glory alone. Amen.